Go. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, it's uh, Isaac speaking from Salibri. I'm joined by my colleague Simon Gilbert, our technical services manager. And today we're going to be uh, discussing and overviewing achieving quality across the construction industry. So without further ado, a little bit of a background on Salibri for you. So we're the market leader in BIM quality assurance and quality control. And we are, our, our customer base spans across the construction industry from major contractors, construction companies, architects, engineering firms, and Salibri has a global footprint. Our head office is based in Helsinki in Finland, and we are a part of the Nemetschek group. So we're the UK arm of Salibri. So first and foremost, it's worth just taking things back to, uh, back to their roots and discussing what actually is quality. And if we define it generically, the quality of any product or service is achieved when it conforms to the desired specifications. But relating that to this industry, quality in construction is conforming to the brief, those project deliverables, making sure that the production of our data and information is reliable and therefore then fit for purpose. And when we review our processes, a bit of a thought provoking statement here is, it's the way that we've always measured quality good enough for our future. And complacency is a bit of a buzzword at the moment, just alongside things like interoperability. But considering the path that it took to get to where we are, is that always enough to get to where we're going? Bit of a, an analogy for a personal statement here, but I was brought up in a family whereby if you say sorry <laughs> for something that you did, you shouldn't make that same mistake again. You shouldn't have to say sorry for the same thing. And I had siblings that would remind me of this lesson quite a lot. But if I didn't have them around and I didn't have that uh, family, you know, <laughs> nagging me and telling me of these lessons, would I have changed? And to use that analogy, that life lesson, is a, it's, it's a small, relatable example of commercial requirements. And if we share those morals and new ways of thinking with each other, the stronger we will become. So quality assuring projects. Is clash detection a part of this? A question that comes up quite a lot. And yes, it is a small part of it, and it's probably the best way to put it. When we're referring to quality assurance, we are talking about a set of planned systematic actions to help us be compliant against the, the requirements of the project. Clash detection is just one of those requirements. So what else can we actually do to quality assure projects? So going beyond the basics, Understanding the project quality plan, reviewing those requirements of the project is going to be key in order for us to prevent errors and delays. And to give an example or a few examples, you could say, we're talking about compliance with code, building codes. I'm not going to get into every single <laughs> example here, but as part of our demonstration today, we'll show you a little bit more about going a little bit further, going beyond clash detection. So considering your backup plans, ways to review performance, your policies, your priorities, the earlier you do them, the more financially cost effective it will be to standardize what you see on screen in that list. Unfortunately, issues do end up on site and issues do cost us a lot of money. And we reduce the risk of them happening when we have the right tools in place to support quality assurance. And the aforementioned checks that were on the previous slide will help us and we can accomplish those within software, Salibri software. So when we focus on connectivity of software, it's also key um, for communication effectiveness, you know, being able to collaborate with others. Using file formats like uh, BCFM collaboration format enable us to communicate effectively what we're actually looking at. And naturally, working to fix the latest issues on the latest models. So getting into BIM properly, it means having the right tools and the right processes in place. And naturally, risk, reputation, and money is on the line if we don't. So from a reactive mentality to being proactive with quality assuring projects, this is a bit of a, 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 just a general quote to share with you, but the more disastrous the mishaps, the simpler the reviewing task. But to, to counter that and to challenge that, can we always afford to learn from our mistakes? Glaring errors aren't the only issues worth overcoming. And is it too late if the mistakes already happened? So we challenge ourselves about our quality assurance processes and then challenge Salibri to let us know if, and, and I will tell you if we can help you. And then when we prepare for the different stages for deliverables, i.e. such as Kobe, and calculate how much time is used to repeat the same issues across multiple projects, when we actually recap on our previous experiences, 
just consider the way that we can be better moving forwards. And change is always on the horizon. It's a part of what makes our journey. This industry is ever evolving and always consider that change is on its way. So in the world of BIM, we are creating more data than ever before. If the data is not correct, we are potentially creating more problems than we're solving and BIM cannot deliver on its promise. I read that word for word because it's a powerful statement and there's no point in moving away from it. It really is that simple. So without further ado, I'll move over to Simon, who's going to showcase and demonstrate just how this works within Celebri Office. OK, thank you, Isaac. Uh, I'm going to stop showing my video at the moment to give you uh, total bandwidth on the screen. Um, and then I'll share the uh, desktop here. So we should be able to then see uh, Celebri. So let me just say share. And there we go. So we should now all be seeing uh, the Celebri model checker um, on the screen. Um, so um, what we're looking at now is the building information model. We have two models loaded here. Uh, one is the architectural model and another one is a, a mechanical model. So the architectural model is those the, that set of components and the ME are those set of components. So it's a simple base, basic model to show the um, functionality of the Celebri sort of engine. Um, has data related to the components and then when we move to our checking area we have a list of checks that we can actually carry out um, to check the model we click on the check button button at the top here and it then executes the uh, the rules that we have uh, that we've defined within this project so we've already discussed uh, Isaac's already mentioned about uh, clash detection. Uh, clash detection within Celebri gives us the ability to do things like duplicate checks to ensure you don't have the same kind of components sitting over the top of each other, as well as components that sit inside other elements. But generally, we also have the ability to then start looking at, um, say, in this case here, building services and other construction components. So a, a typical clash, when I click on the overview level at the top of these issues, we see all of the data related to what's in this section. So you can see here, this is all all the items related to the suspended ceilings, whereas these are all the items related to the walls. Now this gives us very like an overview uh, against the issues that we're looking at and we can then drill down into the individual cases if we want to. So we can go down to this individual, one of the one of those clashes here. And then when we get down to the level of the triangle here, which is the actual issue itself, it then lists the components that are the problematic items. So here's our wall and we have a couple of duct fittings that then are going through that wall component. Now, we also have what's called related components. So Celebri actually has uh, relationships. Uh, those are defined within the authoring system, but come through via um, IFC to add a, a much richer sort of view on the model itself. And we'll see how that affects the ability for us to um, use that within rules as well later on using fire, fire ratings. So here, what we can do is see the context of the system of where that duct actually clashed with that wall. So we're not just looking at the information um, as far as an individual clash in the building where it exists, but we can actually start using these relationships to embellish or to improve the um, understanding of what's actually happening within the model. Um, we also discussed about project deliverables, and most of those start off with um, either clash detection here from a, providing a uh, coordinated building, also the ability to then check data. So one of the first things that people need to be able to go and check is that the actual model files themselves conform to uh, ISO 19650. So we have a rule that we've actually created here using one of our rule templates. And the rule basically goes through and checks to see whether our models, which are these two here, which are the naming of the, the models here, conform to that, that, uh, that standard here. So what we've got here is the national annex for the UK, and uh, this is 2.2. Uh, uh, and here we're, we're checking the masking value. Uh, and the masking value says basically that this MEP based model doesn't conform to the syntax that we've got set up within this rule. So the rule has obviously passed one of these models and the other one has actually failed. Um, and then from then we can then pass the past model into the uh, subsequent checks to make sure that although it's passed the individual um, syntax, so the masking values, that each of the individual values that make up that are also correct. So here we might look at something like the available roles. And if we look at the parameters for this, you can see you can then uh, put the allowed values in here. We can load those up from a spreadsheet and uh, update those relative to the actual project if you need to add two, um, two, uh, two figure um, values here, two character values uh, for project uh, requirements. 
So that's sort of data at a, a very basic level, which should be checked on every project. Um, if we go down to our, um, so a good example of checking other data would be for Kobe, for instance. In this model, we have Kobe data here, and uh, we've just taken a couple of the, um, the fields that we might check for Kobe deliverables. One of them might be that it should have an asset type. And so what we have is a rule here that says, go away and check that actually the uh, values are either fixed or movable. Um, for items that are uh, of this 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 parameter, and what we're doing is we're checking all the Kobe assets in the in the project, and we're then filtering them by the type. So we're not actually we haven't got them based upon the individual components. So what we've got now down here is all of the elements that basically don't have the asset um, asset type set to either fixed or movable. So they're incorrect values at this at this relevant stage. Now for any rule inside Celebri, we obviously get the failures, we also get the past elements. So we can actually see that the model has checked 208 uh, elements. You can see it's past these 56 here. And if we just select them, you can see these are the components that do actually have fixed or movable elements against them. So we can interrogate each of the rules to see what's going on. So it, although it actually shows the failed elements, we can see the, see the past ones as well. Now this is relatively simple because we're checking a field value which is which is passed or failed. If I go to something like Uniclass where we're checking for a classification system applied to components, if we look at this one here, what we're doing here is we say we check the same set of assets here, but actually we'll check this classification. So this is a classification here, and what we're saying is it must be defined, and then we'll sort the issues related to type. So you can see it's already failed, and what we have is three sets of components which are all sorted out by their types that don't have a uniclass classification. That's controlled by our classification functionality in here. And you'll see that if we scroll up, we actually have one called the Kobe uniclass here. And if we look at the, the list that have been classified, so these are all our items that have then passed because they're defined. And these are our undefined sets of elements. Now, the list here is a singular list and it will list each component of that of, of those types uh, but what we really want to do is not to add that add, uh, create a slide for each of those issues uh, to fix those problems because realistically we've only got three issues as we've already seen the classification works on the the pro, uh, premise of that it's it's checking the set of uh, components uh, so it's not checking the whole model and it goes down these these values here and, and evaluates whether or not actually it has this as a PR value. When it finds this within the locality that we specify at the top here, which can be changed, it then gives it the actual classification name. So we know that it's going to be correct and we know it's going to be conforming to the pick list value. So in this case here, if we go back to our checking area, we've got our three issue sets of issues here. Um, and if we wanted to create um, slides of those, then we can then say, add a description, specify who needs to fix that. And we can do the same for each of these um, in the same way. And obviously with um, using um, Celebri Office, uh, if you have, obviously we, we're running this in Celebri Office, so you now have to actually have auto run, so you could create these dynamically. Um, and again, we could then also de generate the uh, presentation dynamically from here as well. So we'll just create the presentation, it creates the three slides here and automatically then we can either synchronize them with an issue management system or report the data out to a BCF report um, or generate a traditional styled um, uh, detail report just in Excel, which would list that data. So that's the process and these are linked back to the issue results so when we get a file that comes through that then um, updates the model um, we should actually see these being rectified by the relevant consultant who's then should have added the PR values for these components uh, as far as the classification. So that's really checking data and data is relatively easy to check um, within Celebri uh, but as we said it goes a lot further than that and um, the first thing uh, to do with you know we've looked at clash detection but obviously then there's requirements for I certain items to touch other items um, so here we have an example of a rule that checks that um, elements that we have in the model must touch other elements so we have a situation here where we have columns and the columns we're saying must actually have some kind of bearing object on top of them. Uh, and what this is actually showing us in this model is that these columns that we see on the screen have nothing between though, them and the um, roof slab above it. So that's 450 millimeters. Now, this is also a really good tool that if you set the element to be 100 percent 
uh, for the element here and the opposing element that it should actually be touching, you can use it as an alignment tool, which is really very useful. And you don't really have to worry about the distance between them because you can set a um, allowable uh, amount of either overlap or gap between those elements. So it can also be used as an alignment tool uh, throughout a project, um, checking things like um, uh, uh, columns within a project don't get larger than the ones at the, at the bottom, that type of thing. Um, so this is like checking things are touching them and then we can then move on to things that are checking um, uh, areas in front of components and behind components. So we have another rule here where we define basically a box um, and the box is defined upon the element we're checking. Um, so it takes the width and the length of the box and the depth of it and we can then modify that relative to the original component. So you can see in this case here we're checking a volume in front of and behind elements. Now this is incredibly useful for things like doors where you might have uh, clashes with the door swings, you might have uh, service elements, you might have bracing across the backs of doors, um, you might have um, uh, beams that cut across the, um, the doors, things like that, which we see on a regular basis within projects. So it's a very, very useful rule to actually check that, um, that we're actually getting the data um, correct in the model. Now, a, a good example of this is this suspended ceiling example, where you can see that the suspended ceiling is not actually physically a clash with the, uh, the window units you see here. It projects the amount onto the floor plan of the, uh, to give us a 2D representation of the amount of area that's taken up by those elements. But if this ceiling was actually set back um, a certain distance, then obviously we wouldn't see a clash in here. Um, it's not a, a physical problem, but it, yeah, obviously it's an aesthetical based issue here. Would be if the windows opened inwards, for instance. So useful, and also we can use this functionality to apply to almost any element. And in this case here, I've just given you an example with the elements we've got in the model, where I've just put a, a large value in here just to show that it, it's actually checking the area in front of, say, a wash and basin here. Might be an electrical cabinet, it might be all those kind of components that you actually want to check that there is that um, free area uh, in front of those, uh, those components. So we may have also the ability to check spaces. Um, we can check them for their validation to make sure that uh, the boundaries are correct. In this case here, the boundary doesn't match the, the physical sort of walls that are around there. Um, that would give us the give us a problem related to volumes uh, um, and also um, uh, would obviously give 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 data incorrectly for things like schedule of accommodation and again we could then run a rule for schedule of accommodation we can pull in an excel spreadsheet of the targeted values and the space names we're expecting to be in the project what tolerances are actually required on those as in what percentage tolerance uh, or minimum and maximum sizes for those rooms and what it does it gives us a list of the failures in the model so for for instance here we have a restroom and it says there are no spaces which are this size here or uh, give or give or give or play 10 percent which is the name of restroom that's because down the bottom here we have this other section area here which says extra spaces so down here we have men and women so obviously in this project where the definition should have been restroom they've been made wrong mechanism so again we can check that we have the right spaces defined as far part of the brief uh, with the schedule accommodation just using the rules that are that are within the box and then manipulating them very much like that with uh, checking some kind of conformance things like uh, corridor widths uh, for instance if we're doing sort of part m kind of uh, basic checks you can see here that what it does is it traces the uh, half the uh, thickness that we put in as a requirement for the corridor widths and puts a, a boundary around here so where you see the boundary that's half the width we put into the actual rule uh, the areas of green are the accessible areas and what it's actually indicating here is the doors that we see on the floor plan here which are red are inaccessible because the corridor is too narrow so uh, it gives us the ability to analyze the actual model. Uh, Salibri gives us the ability to visualize the results, not just saying where something's passed or failed, which is really, um, which is really key. Now we might, we've looked at things like distances between elements as in uh, items that we actually need, um, like clear space between elements. In this case here, we might actually require, um, so here, sorry, let's look at the, that, that, that requirement. So the distance between elements. So what we've got here is clear areas above ceilings. So this rule here, uh, if I right click and look at the rule parameters, what we've got is a rule that checks the minimum requirement. So this is saying we need a minimum of 400 mil from the item on the left hand side, which will be our ceilings to the actual floor slabs above. 
um, we're saying that it's going from the top of the ceiling to the bottom of the floor slab and we need 400 mil. What this is actually showing us is we've got these failures here. So we've got our floor slab, as you can see, and if we then rotate underneath the model, we can then see our ceiling. And there's, there's seven instances of this. And you can see that the minimum gap here is 260. So you might want to combine this rule and say, actually, we've got a minimum requirement here. Uh, but then also we could then change the actual parameters to say uh, that obviously when it gets above 800 mil, then above these ceilings, we might have to check for fire detection uh, devices within that uh, ceiling void area. So we can actually start then stacking these rules, as we'll see in a minute. Um, again, uh, checking uh, distances, uh, door leading edge checks. So in this rule here, what we've got is a floor plan view, which is then checking basically the area of the door leading edge value here that we can see. The rule uh, gives us again the ability to check other data in this rule. So in this case here, we're checking this, this parameter. And you see as we highlight it, it highlights the parameters in the box where we can actually start changing the values that we want to check inside the model. So in this case here, it's highlighting to us that the wall is obviously encroaching within that 300 mil uh, distance between there and the, the uh, line. So it's kind of, it, it's giving you the indication and you obviously for each of these where we get the problems, we can then also create those slides to advise the consultants or the people in-house uh, within your own teams to fix these issues. Uh, you might want to then check distance between elements on the model to say that we must have a component within a certain distance of another component. So here we actually have uh, a situation where it's checking um, WCs and uh, against wash and basins. Um, what we're saying here is a WC must have a wash and basin within 750 millimeters of it. Now the actual floor plan takes that shape, projects it down for the object that we're looking at, and then measures from that projection over a 2.5D 2, 2, 2 dimension, so the 2D dimension here in this case, um, using the 3D geometry. And it's telling us it's 936 here, and we've actually required it to be 750. So if I look at this rule, you can see that we're using 750 here, and we're using a different mechanism with this rule that says horizontal distance between the footprints, and we project them down and measure the distance between the two. So that's what that's done. But in this case here, what it's doing is it's actually checking a, a complete sort of um, radial sort of tracking on that. And if there was a uh, wash and basin within the women's toilet here, then basically it would say it's passed if it's within this red area. So uh, that's obviously not acceptable. So what we can do with these is we can add context related to the, the spaces within the model. So hence, uh, we're checking the spaces are modeled correctly in the first place. What we can do is then restrict this just to the space itself. So if I recheck this model and then look at the actual data now, you'll see that what we have here is it's now only checking that space. So it ignores the rest of the model and just checks the distance in this physical space itself. Now that can be extended. Um, so if you're checking things like um, uh, we've got models which are accommodation uh, for, you know, like flats or those types of things or apartments. What we can do is we can start grouping uh, elements. So we have a special classification uh, inside Salibri called uh, space grouping classification. And you'll see here what we have is one that's set up called other. And if we look at the edu education and conference areas in here, you can see that what it does, it takes into account these different areas. Within Salibri, uh, we have the uh, functionality called space grouping. Um, what that does is it gives us the ability to see this data. Uh, we can see if we look at that educational conferencing here, we can see it's 99 meters squared. And the spaces that make up that area, you can see are being shown on the screen now. So you can see there is individual spaces, but it also does the calculation of those grouped areas across the plan. So it's useful for uh, exporting data and getting uh, this kind of um, uh, these area uh, or combined areas. But we can use this within the same rule. So if we go back to the rule again now and we use that classification, so we'll go into here and say use a space group now and then specify the space group that we're going to use. So we can drop that down and say we used other here. Again, just at the bottom here, we can say that actually we only require one, one, one wash hand basin for the target elements. If we then run, and run the check on the model, you'll see now what it's done is extended that area related to that space grouping. So now it's found two wash hand basins, but both of those are uh, too far away from the, uh, the WC that we see on the screen. So very, very useful um, using that sort of context with uh, any kind of components, really. Um, so I'll take you through two other things that Salibri is able to do. And what we'll look at first of all is sort of relationships. So if we go to the relationships here, I'm just going to go back to an information takeoff again here. 
And what I've done is I've set a, a classification. Now the classifications inside Salibri give us the ability to look at the model um, using the data against the elements. So in this case here, what I've done is I've created one called fire ratings for doors and the walls within the project. And I've color coded those fire ratings to uh, zero minutes, 30 and 60, because that's what we have in our model. But already what we can start to see, and we can also list this out within a information takeoff as well. But you can see straight away where we get these mismatches. In this case here, we have a door that has no fire rating and we have a wall that has a 30 minute fire rating. So visually we can see this data really, really easily but it helps to add context to the actual rule results as well so when we go to our checking area here and we're now looking at our relationships and looking at the rule results um, what we're now now seeing is the data then that then is, is is incorrect so what we have here is a door that doesn't have the right rating it doesn't have any rating we have this one here that has the wrong rating it has a, th a 30 minute rating instead of a 60 minute rating and this, these rules are checking the parameters of this object against this object using a relationship. So if I right click on the, the rule here to show you how it's configured, what we're doing here is we are checking the doors and what we're doing is checking a parameter called fire rating. We then check in the same wall that basically uh, that we check the wall itself and then we check the wall's fire rating and we're saying that it's got to be uh, greater than or equal to less than or equal to in this case here to create a, uh, re a correct result for us now if we select the wall itself we're using these relationships here so the relationship has a void in it and if i double click on the opening here is this takes us to uh, a situation where we have the filling element which is the door and back to the wall here so if we go to the door here, we're now looking at the door information. So we're using the data that's inside this door, but using this relationship functionality to go and check that data against those elements. So finally, really, we've seen a, a number of different templates within Salibri uh, driving different results. What I'd like to do is, is just move over to finally uh, using what's called gatekeeper rules. And gatekeeper rules means that we can use any of these types of rules and use them with each other to refine the information that we're actually seeing. So within this rule here, the first rule that we might be looking at, so let's just show the actual model here. So we look at the M&E model, for instance, here. Um, what I might be doing within an M&E sort of uh, check, as I might want to check that if I had, for instance, electrical conduit that, that I hadn't got um, uh, any, um, any duct work or pipe work within a certain distance of those elements uh, running in parallel um, within a certain distance. So I can go away and check that kind of information. So the first thing I might want to do is isolate all the horizontal and vertical sets of elements. So straight away, if I go to the first, first rule here that we've got, the first rule I've created is the identification of the horizontal ducts. So if I right click on this rule, all I'm doing here is using that same comparison rule again I'm saying go and select a duct, go and set the target value for that duct to be the start offset, and then don't factor it anyway. Use the actual components, the check components, and then set the constraint end offset value and say they must be equal to each other. So what that does in the background, if I look at the data, is it's checked these 150 elements here, uh, which are the ones we see on the screen. And we see the ones that have passed are these elements. So they're all our horizontal ones. And the ones that are failed, uh, if you see the results here, are all the vertical and the non-horizontal elements here, these angled ones. So very, very simple to actually highlight all those horizontal elements. So what we do is we then pass the past elements to the next rule. And the next rule, what we're doing with this rule is we're saying, well, I'm not interested in the small segments. What I'm actually interested in is physical runs of pipe work. So I want to look at anything that's over a meter in size. So what I can do now is if I look at it, it's now gone down to 92 elements, which was off the previous one. I can now look at the past elements. So these are our longer sections of the, those same pipes. And if we look at the uh, failed elements, uh, these are all the smaller segments, as you can see. So we've basically isolated by using a parameter, set of parameters, the items, uh, both from a horizontal down to a, a size uh, check, which means now we're going to get something meaningful when we go to the final rule here which is using our distance that you've already seen. So we're now using our distance between elements, but we're using horizontally alongside now. And by using the horizontally alongside with a certain value, we can then go away and check that the, uh, the, the of the 19 elements here, we've got two fa failures and we've got these ones that have passed. So if you look at the two failures, we're all automatically seeing that our 200 mil is being breached at this end 
of the uh, of, you know well basically anywhere across here which is 160 66.8 millimeters so you can see that we can use uh, um, e either the relationships in the model we can also use the uh, different rule templates that we have within the model and we have um, around about 60 of those rule templates and we also have an API which enables you to generate your own rule templates for checking your own custom sort of solutions within within Solibri. Um, and then you can obviously stack those uh, those rule templates like I've done here with the, what's called a gatekeeper rule to pass the past or failed elements, whichever we're interested in, to the next rule to check other conditions uh, or to subsequently check the, the next condition or um, within that model. So hopefully that gives you a bit of an insight to the kind of checks that you know you, you could actually start to, um, to move forward with and um, try and address some of these issues to do with the project, not only from a, a basic coordination point of view and a um, conformance as far as the data in the project, but also any of the requirements that are, that are needed or the kind of things that crop up and cause problems time and time again. So thank you very much. Uh, I'll hand you back to Isaac now just for a, a, a summary. Fantastic, thanks very much, Simon. So hopefully you can all see my screen just for the last slide. Um, but uh, again, hopefully that was a, an insight into achieving quality with Celebri. And uh, again, just to summarize, we're looking at the early identification of issues, improved modeling and the modeling standards. We're providing a sustainable quality assurance platform and toolkit for you to utilize against your projects. And naturally we're looking to de-risk and reduce costs across your projects. So, back to yourself Sita again thanks very much for listening and, and taking the time to uh, to be with us today and that's everything from us <laughs>